We're here with probably the most decorated guest we've ever had on the show. You've got that experience of working with the biggest artist on the globe, Beyonce. All these doors are open, but your life is still kind of the same mm. in an interesting way that you might not expect. And so that taught me like, oh, there's no silver bullet. A big problem that we have in the country is just being undercapitalized in general, specifically in music. We have to operate with limitations. We don't have government support. So we have to be innovative. Our disadvantage actually becomes our advantage. If we can become a bridge and have the US market kind of see South Africa as a good place, to put investment, suddenly you can make superstars, and now we're seeing that. Tyler is a great example of that. Use that art, help us gain access, start cracking the door, it's to the point that other creatives can start to come in. So the person listening to this, what do you say to them? Start. Whatever your vision is, whatever resources you have, start. Episode 18, Seacast. We're here with probably the most decorated guest that we've ever had on the show. Like, we can officially say that we are a podcast that has Grammy award-winning guests. And I must say, it goes beyond that because a lot of the reason why I am here today where I am and I've taken the journey that I've taken is because of this man sitting across from me. So, first of all, welcome to the Seacast, Bubele. It's an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you for having me, Josh. Yeah. So... A lot of people might not know this, but we go, we go back. <laughs> like when I was having you, when I was planning this show, I was so excited to chat with you because we have so much history to look back on. And I, when I think of Bubele, I think of like going to one of my best friends, Abo's place, sitting on the computer, pulling up a folder of an advert Real men <laughs> don't drink pink drinks. <laughs> that was probably one of my proudest moments in high school. Yeah. <laughs> no, so that I don't think you know this, but that was essentially the genesis of everything that I'm doing today, personally. And I think as well for Abo, um, who ever might be watching this, who doesn't know Abo, Abo Boy is a, a producer that's um, a good friend of the creator community. But... That's where it all started, man. Like we saw you guys do an advert for a business project on your parents' computer. And we were like absolutely gobsmacked by the level of quality that it was, the writing, the shooting, the comedic timing. Like we were so inspired. Yeah. And I think like you, you guys were what, three years above us in that school. Yeah. And... What was so crazy about that is I think there was always this kind of like unsaid rivalry that <laughs> that kind of happened to like, I I would say maybe for it was just came from our side. I don't know. <laughs> but we saw that video and we were like, nah, we need to do better. Like, this is great, but we want to do better than this. That's like, dope. I feel like that kind of rivalry, because there's no like animosity, it's just about yeah. being like, okay, that's the bar now. Yeah. You know, I think that that goes a long way. And I think that, Specifically in high school, when you have grades like that and you see a grade do dope things, you're like, okay, mm -hmm. that's the bar for me. It was David Matenji's grade and they oh, were yeah. in high school plays and they were just the funniest guys yeah. who had ever done a play. And they were creative and just like, they were so cool as a grade. And then for me, that became the blueprint of like, okay, we need to do this. Then our time came and it was like, oh, we're really good at like film. We had, that's like Dominic and these creative people, we just came together and made these very cool ideas. And then I'm glad it inspired you guys to be like, okay, that's the bar now. That's yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And it's just about kind of leveling up and leveling up and the people, and it's, I think it's also about imparting something on the people below you. Right. Which is why it's so important as people to show up in what we do, because we're not just showing up for ourselves. We're actually showing up for the people looking at us as well. Right. Because you guys, went and did this whole thing of producing this like production for the, this project and you did such a good job on it it inspired something on us to take that to the next level like you said so when you're really showing up you're not just showing up for yourself you're kind of showing up for the next people that are coming beyond you and i love that you brought that up because that really talks to kind of paying it forward and that's kind of why we started this podcast because like being a 26 year old business owner being in the space for like 
what's our fifth year now, there's so many lessons that we've learned along this journey that we can impart and share onto others that can help inspire their journeys or maybe see how they can kind of join the shared vision that we have here to connect Africa to the digital economy and the world to Africa. Um, but likewise, that's why I needed to get you on the show because you've also had all of this experience and you've been on this insane journey of going and traveling the world. I mean, right now you're based in LA, you're busy producing for some of the biggest artists in South Africa who are blowing up all across the world, which is fantastic to see and super exciting to talk about. Um, and then obviously you've got that experience of working with what some would argue is the biggest artist on the globe, Beyonce, like, come on. So I know that you've done many interviews and spoken a lot about the whole opportunity that you had to produce on the Lion King album. But I don't want us to talk on that. Anyone who's listening to that and wants to find out more about that, please go check out the Posties podcast because there's a fantastic interview that Bobele did there where he explains that experience and everything behind that. But I wanted us to talk a little bit today about kind of your journey, like where it started, where you are now, and where you headed to. So that's why I wanted us to talk about way back in school. And I want to take it back to like the prototype days. <laughs> I will go there. Man. So I think that if I go to where I started with music and production, at least, so I really loved music as a kid. It was one of my early, very big passions. I begged for piano lessons and eventually my parents were like, okay, you can, you can do it. You can take these lessons. And I took them. They allowed me to take them a year earlier than most people are allowed just because I was begging so much and I loved it. And then I just loved technology. And those were two separate things in my head. And eventually we got to the point where my dad came back with a laptop and it had a production software on it. And I'd never seen anything like that. And just sitting there in that chair, like time stopped moving for me. And literally that was the day that I decided this is what I want to do with my life. And so I've been pursuing it since then. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to start learning how to produce, making beats, whatever. I found uh, Caleb Kalonji, who was in my grade, and he was at the time writing raps, really looked up to Eminem. I was like, I'll make the beats, you rap. And we had like a trashy microphone with a dishcloth over it in my bedroom, trying to make the wardrobe feel like it's a booth. And just making so many mistakes, but loving it. Just every single Saturday at 12 p.m. we would meet. And for me, that's some of like the happiest times that I've had is not knowing how to do this thing. There was no real blueprint mm -hmm. for becoming a producer. So it was just consuming things on YouTube and teaching myself and trying the, to do the best that I possibly could and hoping that I'd meet the right people along the way. And that's what's happened. God's just opened up doors and I've met certain folks that have just either propelled me forward or um, put gasoline on what it, whatever was already happening. But I had to already be taking the steps. And I think that's the big thing is no one wants to be the person to start the boulder moving. I think that's something I learned very early on. People are excited to help think something that already has momentum. But being part of the, the initial phases, that's on you to figure it out and just start doing it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, started the band and just started playing things. And playing at school was awesome. We'd play at youth and then some of the high schools around and then we made this dance and then the whole school would do it. And it was really a cool time to rally support and look at what the music industry feels like and just really pursue the thing as best as we could Mm. Um, while being in high school and just having fun with it. So it was a, it's a very special time in my life. Just start. Yeah. Right. Just and start, literally just do it. And it's crazy. Like the, the starting point is always the hardest because like you mentioned with that boulder analogy is to, to get that boulder starting to move is hard and you don't see much results. You put in a lot of effort with only a minuscule movement of this boulder but then as you progress and you progress, the boulder gains momentum and more and more momentum. And then you start to see that there's more action happening over time. And I think finding that passion at such a young age is such a blessing because a lot of the people watching this, and I think young people in general nowadays are really struggling to find that why. Um, because we go online and we see all these people doing amazing things 
achieving these fantastic goals and we kind of start finding ourselves living the lives of others instead of focusing internally on ours. And I think that's kind of maybe what we had as an opportunity as like young people that didn't necessarily live in the same social world that we in now as we kind of had the opportunity to play around. I mean, I remember when I used to come to your house and Abo and I would be messing around on the iMac. I mean, it's so like we have such similar parallels. It's crazy. But that was the first time I ever saw like a video editing software was through iMovie on that on that iMac. You guys were making these horror films. Dude, have you seen those films, by the way? I, we need to sign an NBA because <laughs> I'm waiting for you to be very, very, very successful. Then I'm going to drop it. The, like, you know, our prototype, which is the band in high school, we have like our first mixtape. The Homecoming. Uh -huh. I've also got freshman it. Year, freshman year. Freshman year. On, freshman year. It's on, it's on CD. And I'm going to upload that in like 10 years time to, to streaming website. I think it'll be awesome. No edits, no anything. Yeah. Like, as it was when we were 17. Yeah. Just out into the world. And I, I look forward to it. But it's, it's cool to like see that CD and be like, that's where it began. Mm -hmm. I actually have the CD. I want to take it back with me to LA and like frame it and put it in my studio just to be like, this is part of the genesis. 100%. I've also got that album, by the way. So hey, we've got leverage here. We've got leverage. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no. So yeah, I think like coming back to that why, right? A lot of people struggle to find that. And like, I will hear your story. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we all have our own paths, right? So in your path, you were lucky to find it at a young age. Um, but in the greater scheme of things, I mean, we still not, we still, I would say we're still young. Like we're, we still got a lot of time. So to anyone who's watching this that might not have found that, like you still have the opportunity to find that. Um, but being someone that kind of discovered that at a young age, like what kind of, because a lot of people have this question and I'm sure people probably asked you as well, like, how did you find that? Why? That's an interesting question, actually. And I think that to explain my stance on this kind of goes to, a, to this concept that Tyler, the creator actually spoke about is that in this day and age, it's harder to be a fan of a thing because everything is so easily successful. Everything is so easily accessible. Mm -hmm. So in the past, someone would be wearing like a dope pair of sneakers and you'd be like, oh, those are crazy. And they'll be in like a specific color and you'd be like, where did that guy find them? And then you could go on this hunt and try and find the brand and try and, it's this, you have to like really be invested to find these things. Whereas now someone's wearing it and you click on a link and you have it. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the process of going and discovering a thing that makes you a fan of that it's why even with music artists music that people discover on their own randomly and then put other people on to tend to be like they have a more of an emotional attachment to that than music that has been like kind of force fed to them via large media outlets or algorithms even if you love it mm -hmm. you don't have the same attachment to it and you don't watch their career grow and be like yo dude i found this guy when he was on youtube and now he's like doing these crazy things and so i think that finding your why is being willing to be a fan of things and a cool example for me is like i'm really into these sneakers that i'm wearing now they're new balance 2002 and they're in purple but you can get them in all these colors and i love them like i'm i've got them in purple and now i've got them in cream and i'm trying to slowly save up and buy them in all different colors and i'm a fan of them they're not necessarily the most fashionable thing right now. I know everyone's wearing sambas or like there's very distinct fashion trends, but I'm okay to be a fan of a thing that I think looks cool. Mm. And then that begins to inform my tastes. And as you inform your taste, then you start to know like what you like mm. and what you like, what gives you energy. Can't, you're kind of building your identity. Exactly. And as you see what gives you energy, I think that's what finds you find your why. And your why changes and distills over time. Mm. For me, it was like, I'm following this music thing. I want to be a producer. <clears throat> that was the main thing. It's like, I want to be a producer. And then now I've gotten to the point where I realized that the thing that I actually love is I'm a builder. I love building things in a team of dope people. That is what I love. Nothing frustrates me more than bureaucracy and politics mm. in a creative endeavor, um, corporate structures with like, arcane and okay like, archaic yeah. archaic ways of thinking i hate that there's nothing more exciting to me than having four or five people in a team trying to achieve something 
it can be outside of music. That's why I have all these other ventures that I'm exploring is because I love to build things. And once I realize that as a driving factor, it sort of shifts things in an interesting way. And, but it had to start somewhere. And music was the first thing where like you're building something and you're building something with four people in a band. Mm. And every day you're meeting, how are we marketing this? How are we getting this out? How are we recording this? What about the gig? And then it just grows and snowballs from there. And so I just, I would encourage anyone who's trying to figure out like, what are they passionate about? Is like nothing, don't be afraid to like anything. Like this whole thing of a guilty pleasure, like bro, if you like Katy Perry, say you like Katy Perry. I love Katy Perry. I think Teenage Dream is one of the best pop records that has ever been written. And people feel like their taste has to be cool, but whatever is cool is what's in right now. And the thing about what's in is that eventually it'll be out. Mm. But if you are a fan of a thing because you're a fan of it, that's the genesis of something and you'll stumble on other people who dig it and you create something dope. Don't be afraid to go on that journey of discovery because yeah. it's not about, it's not like, it sounds so cliche. And I think, I'm, I think you mentioned this somewhere, but it sounds so cliche. It's not about the end goal. It's about the journey yeah. of getting there. Yeah. And that's where you start to discover who you are and build that identity. And the more you go along that journey down this pathway, you start to solidify other people's understanding of you as well, but also evolve it. And I'm so excited for us to get in a little bit more about this concept of building because right now, most people, when they look at you, they're going to think producer, right? But then I'm assuming over time, it's going to shift to like, no, this is more than just producing. Producing is maybe the how, but it's not necessarily the what, right? Um, but coming back to that why, like you've kind of described how you found the why, but I don't know if you've kind of defined it. Like... So I know you work really hard. You are constantly building different tracks for all these different artists. You're building people's brands. Um, you're constantly reaching out. I mean, we recently had a discussion on education space and how we can implement tech solutions in that space. Like you're doing a lot and there's a driving force behind you. What is that driving force? I think, okay, think about this. You can, it's a tricky one. Yeah. I think for me, as I move towards like a new phase of my life, I've had to have a really salient understanding that this is my life. I think at every step, I was always waiting for the next thing. And high school is like, I can't, I need to finish high school so that I can do the next thing. And then you get out of high school and then you go to university, like, I need to like finish university so that I could go do my master's and I want to do them overseas. Then you get overseas and then you do, <laughs> you're doing the master's overseas. Like, this is so great, but I can't wait to move to LA. And then I moved to LA and now I'm like, oh, well, now what? Bro, that's the problem with having goals. Like, cause you have these goals and then you work hard and then you light up achieving them. And then you get there and you're like, damn. <laughs> and then, exactly. Yeah. So now I, I've had to have this, this understanding that I'm living the life. Yes, there are ways in which it could be better. Um, and I could have more financial stability or like a different lifestyle, maybe shop at different grocery stores. But to be honest, like this is the life that I wanted. I get to make music with my friends every single day. And then on the days that I don't feel like doing that, I get to work on these other startups and other projects that excite me. And there's no more waiting for the next thing. So it's made me very present mm. in now. There is no only when or if when, because I think that I, okay, here's an example of something that, that I think is so interesting. When the Beyonce song was coming out, before it came out, we couldn't speak about certain things. And it was just a long journey up and down. And like you said, I've spoken about it. But when it comes out, it is both the most life-changing thing, but also not. Like your life is still the same. Mm. Like also all these doors are open, but your life is still kind of the same. Mm. in an interesting way that you might not expect. And so that taught me like, oh, there's no silver bullet. You just keep doing the thing and you have some highs and then you have some normal days and you have some lows, but it's, that's the life. And then we had another opportunity to work with this band um, in Sweden called Noted. And we worked with some writers and this writer hadn't had a song with like a bigger artist before. 
And so it was a year of back and forth. And eventually they decided they want to put the song out. And this writer was so convinced that it was going to change their life. And inside, as much as I tried to caution, I was like, hey, man, like, this is going to be cool, but, you know, mm. you don't know what's going to happen. Let's just let it be. We, it's not in our control what happens, mm. whether people listen to it or not. Once the song is out, it's out. And so I could see how excited the writer was. And then the song came out, and it didn't perform the way that they had expected it to be. And they started blaming the label for not marketing it well or marketing a different single too soon or, like, where's the content on this? Why isn't it being pushed, et cetera, et cetera. And I could see the disappointment that they had from that. And it kind of taught me, like seeing that and in light of my own experience, I kind of saw that coming. And you realize that oh, you can't even, the end goal thing is the goals just keep moving. So you, there has to be a point where you say, okay, end goal is nice. It's just a marker of, okay, reassessing. But now I'm, really digging into process and so this year what i've been thinking about and even last year is my goals are output driven they're not outcomes driven mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. so i will want to say i want to put out five songs in the next three months whether or not anyone listens to them is not the goal because i don't actually have control i can implement strategies i can think about ways to market it i can do all of those things but whether or not someone clicks play has nothing to do with me. Therefore, I can't have a goal of I want 50,000 streams or 100,000 streams or a million streams. How do I even begin to control that? So my goal is I want to put the song out. Then after that, I say I want to make 25 TikToks about the song. And then I say I want to make so many posts about the song. As long as I'm hitting those markers, what happens along the way, we learn from the data. But we to make sure that your outcomes isn't, I want to make a TikTok that does 1.2 million. It's just not the way that that's going to go. And once that shift happened in my head, it became, life just became so much more exciting and so much less pressure. Mm -hmm. So as I'm hearing you speak, I'm hearing you talk a lot of like the internal perspective of it, right? So this is kind of your th thought process that helps you drive these things that you're working on and helps make sure that there's this framework that you set out happens right is there more of like a external side of it because when i look at your music and when i look at your career a lot of the stuff that you've done has had a huge impact on the people listening to it and that's an external impact could you tell me a little bit more about the external kind of dr i don't know if there's an external driving force. i think the external factors would be this vision that we have of being the bridge for Africa in the music space. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Western music world and the African music world and just being a bridge for South African artists into the larger markets. I think that's something that I'm very passionate about and we try and do that in the, whatever way we can. Um, you know, in some ways it's like, an artist like Will, who's from South Africa and now is has an international US label deal and he's growing his fan base in Europe and in the US. And that's the South African kid who's doing that or working with someone like Manana, who's South Africa's leading R and B act in my opinion, and um the best songwriter on the continent in my opinion. And now you're seeing that that come to fruition with like Burner Boy writings and Usher, a song by Usher just came out that he wrote and um being able to watch him do that and walk alongside him as he does it and help him without what connections we can and the connections that he has on his own and like creating a scene is just, it's very cool to see it slowly bubbling. And um, I think that a big problem that we have in the country is just being undercapitalized in general, across the board in, in all places, but specifically in music. And so, if we can become a bridge and have, you know, the U.S. market kind of see South Africa as a good place to put investment, to them it's lower stake investments because they might not even have to pay U.S. fees. But even if you give a discount of 30% or 40%, it 
in South Africa it can go a long way. Yeah. And suddenly you can make superstars. And now we're seeing that. Tyler is a great example of that. And I think that she is very important to this market for people to see, okay, we can invest in Africa and it can work. In fact, Tyler is doing what a lot of the US art labels are struggling to do with the US artists. And so, yeah, I think that's an external driver, I would say, is like trying to be the bridge for South Africa and um, facilitate wherever we can. And it helps us grow our careers. And then in turn, we funnel it back and just, it's like this feedback loop. And um, it's very interesting when I've said this of like the work that I've done with Will and Manana has done so much more for my career than the song that I did with Beyonce. And that's very interesting because the Beyonce song definitely opened up doors. But when you produce for an artist and you are part of their journey as they grow to prominence, there's a lot of trust that comes with that. And I think that that is exciting to me more than just working with the big names because at the end of the day, until you have those people in your phone and you can just like text them and like hang out with them and then send them music, it's not, it's not quite, you are a replaceable cog in their machine. And I think that it's way more valuable to be a bespoke entity and piece of an artist's career than a disposable cog in a big artist's career because tomorrow they change their sound, they go to someone else and now that's it for you. So that's a, yeah, I don't know if this sounds Yeah, no, there's benefits in building. Yeah. There are benefits in building. Yeah. And in this case of Beyonce's situation, there's nothing really to build there because yeah. Beyonce is already built. Like, she was going to do what she was going to do with or without me. Yeah. Even the, the Grammy thing, which is, it's not even that I won a Grammy. It's like the project was nominated for a Grammy. I think it won one of them and um, was nominated for another. And that's, a, like, that's, a, that's insane for me to think, you know, 17 year old me would never have thought that I'd even be part of that. But it's also cool to, for me to be like, I'm really excited to do that and to have nominations and wins with artists that I started with together in a basement at university, you know? Yeah. That for me gives me a lot of energy and a lot of excitement. Um, so, yeah. I think in that sense, it's you stepping into who you are, which is Bubele, the one who builds. Like, and I think what what I'm getting from what you're saying is like building these artists, it's more in alignment with who you are and it's more rewarding because you're creating something out of nothing. I think people underestimate how difficult it is to take something that exists in your mind and bring it into reality. Like that, and that's essentially what a creator does, right? And that's why we call this the creator community because it's about creativity. It's about creating. And um, mental fortitude. Yeah. Something that I think a lot of people aren't prepared for when they step into the creative economy because they think it's fun to just make videos and make music and yes, but also it takes an immense amount of mental fortitude to create something, put it in the world and to not let what the world thinks of that stop you from continuing to create. Mm -hmm. That is tough. It, if I think of the music industry in terms of business, it's like Every single day, you put a product on the market that no one cares about and you continue to invest. You're like, no, guys, I promise you it'll work. And for some reason, maybe seven years down the line, it does work. In business terms, we would have stopped this at month eight. We'd have been like, chaps, it's not the one. But just the resilience you have to have to do that is insane. I mean, even for me, understanding that even I want to create content that showcases what I do. And what does that mean for me? Now suddenly I'm having to be on camera and this is a very different medium to my medium, which is no face. I'm just in my studio making the music. Mm. Suddenly being in front of a camera and showing my face and people and the way that I react is a completely different space that now I need to learn how to express myself. I need to gain a huge amount of mental fortitude to be okay with looking the way that I look, be okay with the sound of my voice and the look of my face and whatever ticks I might have and just be like, this is me, let's go. 
it's beautiful to see yourself stepping into that, bro. Like, and just based off of what you've achieved so far, I can only imagine what you are going to achieve the more you step into this bubele. Like, that's going to be such a beautiful journey to watch. And this is just the beginning. Coming back to that, that's also why I wanted to focus on the why, because that mental fortitude is, you. it's impossible to have unless you have some sort of why that drives you to do that, because it's painful. Like every failure or loss, well, a lot of people call it an L, really it depends how you view it, right? Because to one person, it might be a loss, to another person, it might be a lesson. I think in your case, it's sounding like it's the latter, right? Yeah, it is a lesson. I mean, even... As a person who likes to build things, for instance, it's very interesting that music is my career that pays my bills and I code on the side for fun. It's usually the opposite way. But that was really cool to go and build in university for my master's degree. I built this app, essentially, and it was called Amood. And what it does is that it was basically like Shazam, but it, what I did was I found that at the time, a lot of point of sales um, units in the US were iPads. And I was like, oh, what if I could just leverage the microphone on the iPad to Shazam the music that's playing in the bar, and then I could recommend to you nightclubs or bars depending on your music taste. You're like, yo, I want hip hop tonight, or I want R&B. Be like, these are the places that I can go. And it's all real time. And so I built this, and it was just so exciting to like see my vision like actually working. And then I was like, this is dope. I want to start a company off of this and started to work together with some developers and it slowly started coming together. We recruited a few more people and it was very exciting. That was my first like just actual failure. And I've had to shelve that project because of the struggling to be able to get people to believe in it, struggling to raise funds for it. And um, even the landscape has just changed so dramatically post COVID um, Square has taken over the market, so now point of sales is owned by a different company. Which, so it, it becomes a different ecosystem to live in, and there are still so many times I wish this tool existed in the world, and it's something that I am still going to pursue. But I have to learn something there. Of if you are building something and the vision is your vision, and you can't inspire people to make the vision their vision, you're out of luck. Because you are pushing the hill, the boulder up the hill, and you're also pushing the people to push it with you. So if I stop moving the boulder, everyone else stops. What you want is a bunch of people that when you have to step away, they all keep pushing. And I'm seeing that now in a venture that I'm working with where every person is firing on different cylinders and one person might step away for a week because their, their job is just, it's very demanding. And they come back and we're like, oh yeah, so this is what we've done. These are the documents, but we're still moving. Then maybe I have to step away because it's Grammys week or whatever. And we have to do a whole bunch of certain things and deadlines and sessions. And then I come back and they're like, yeah, dude, we just had a four hour long meeting. This is what we discussed. This And that for me opened my eyes. But the fact that I had to close my first startup essentially and just fold was an L, but a lesson really well learned and painful because it's hours and hours and hours of investment and also a lot of money on my behalf of like buying tools and whatever, whatever. But it's a stepping stone, right? Stepping stone. For sure. And that's so exciting. Like there's many lessons that I'm sure you've learned. And I want to take us a little bit back to you going from South Africa to LA and, or you first went to New York and then you went to LA. So. I think it's important that we touch on this because traveling opens up your eyes a lot because we live in South Africa, right? South Africa is very far away from the world. Like that's one thing that I realized from my recent travels a few years back is we are a 10 hour, 12 hour flight from most first world places. So we're quite disconnected geographically from the rest of the world. I think having the internet helps because we have a window into what's happening all across the globe, but there's still that geographical limitation and we don't have the full experience of what it's like living in different countries. So I think as South Africans, if you haven't traveled abroad, there's certain things that we consider normal here that in the global space of the world is not really normal. So like, just to give you an example, when I went to Portugal, I was out with my cousin. It was, 
I was, oh, I was so shocked. I was like, people are eating dinner at like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. What? And then because people are eating dinner so late, they're going out late. So you land up driving down the roads at like two o'clock in the morning and you see two ladies walking by themselves. And for me in my head, I'm like warning signs are going off. I'm like, flip, these people need help. What are they doing? Like, are they crazy? And then you realize, oh no, like this is just normal here. People can just walk in the middle of the night and be safe. Whereas here, our brains are very differently attuned to the context of our reality, which is very different where you can't necessarily do that. So that's just one kind of mundane example, but I'm sure that there's other examples that you might have experienced and kind of like learned across the way that I think could be very valuable to someone listening to this. So how was that transition going from South Africa to like New York? And then also what is the kind of difference that you've seen from New York to LA? So I will say that I actually strongly believe that South Africans have an advantage because we have a context that the Western world, let me speak for the States because that's the context, that, uh, the secondary context that I know. They don't even know our problems. We have issues and contexts and dynamics that they can't even begin to fathom. And those issues and problems can be solved by businesses and generate incredible amount of income and access for people and help for people in our country. I think that when I look at these different countries, there are things that just fundamentally so different, even in the way that people interact with each other, that gives us as South Africans a leg up. South Africans, as much as like our history is hectic, we rarely deal with things with humor, whether it's current or past, and we're open to having uncomfortable conversations about politics and about our stances and views on things and still remaining friends, even in, in disagreement or maybe disagreement. And that makes us incredibly resilient, I think, to awkward conversations, whereas in America, that is not the case. People essentially alienate themselves from folks who don't believe the same thing as them. And that, I find that very interesting. And these what, are obviously generalizations. Yeah. But what happens then is that when you alienate yourself from people that believe different things than you, you get into this silo of everyone thinking the same. And you can actually, you stop even understanding the problems or the driving desires or their pain points of other people in your world, in your immediate vicinity. And so us as a South Africans, when we go into the Western world, we can actually look at different people and different people groups and start to synthesize information in a way that I think that the locals cannot because their communities are quite siloed. And so I think that's something that South Africans, that differs like on an ethos level, also the way that we're kind and we'll speak to anyone. It's so incredible to go to the States and like speak to the cashier and just ask her like, how was how your day? She's like, it's good, thank you. How is yours? I'm like, oh, not too bad, yada, yada, have a little chat. And then it's just the fact that a teller was like taken aback when I spoke to her was interesting to me because here, if I walk up to a teller and just put the things down, she's gonna go, hello, put. <laughs> And she's going to fold her arms until I greet. You know, like what kind of parent raised you that you're just going to walk up to my till and not even greet me? And so these are the small interactive things that I, I sort of see that give us a leg up and opportunities that other people won't be able to, to do. And I think that if we can go there and look at like America really is the cutting edge of like startup world because they have so much capital. So it attracts all founders to go there to raise. So they have all of this great technology. I just think that there's these cool technological things that are solving non-issues really. And for us, I think we have the opportunity to go there, see what's happening and come back and have use that technology in a way that they couldn't even fathom to solve actual issues, like not first world issues. Like does your dog need a workout? That's not the kind of problems that we're dealing with here in South Africa. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. It's interesting that you say that. I also have a similar theory where I believe that in South Africa, 
we have 10 times the problems, but one tenth of the resources. And this comes to a conversation about creativity, because I believe that it's a lot more difficult to be creative when you have access. So for example, if I'm shooting a production and my budget is 10,000 rands, there's a limitation there. I have a box. And because I'm in this box, I have to figure out, I have to be creative. How do I use this in the best way possible? And I think that's why we have this secret sauce. I always talk about the secret sauce that South Africans have because we go abroad and we have these ideas that people have never thought about and they're completely blown away with it. Like, and we see it a lot in the artistic space with Tyler, with Trevor Noah, like Trevor Noah, like he came from that box, right? He had to fit into the certain, these certain ideas of what it means to be a mixed race kid, kind of having to fit in this black box and also fit in this white box. And I think that's why he's so creative in the way he is because he had to f make all of these boxes work. So what kind of happens is we see that our disadvantage actually becomes our advantage because we have to operate with limitations. We don't have government support. So we have to be innovative. And that's why I think we have some of the most innovative people. Yeah. Genuinely. Yeah. And I think that's, that's across the board in a lot of fields. I mean, even things were like, I might be speaking out of turn here. So anyone in the middle medical community, feel free to um, correct me. But it's my understanding that South African doctors are really sought after because the level of training that we get in this country, you know, being in South Africa, you might see more gunshot and stab wounds in two weeks than most doctors in Switzerland will see in their lifetime. And so your trauma skills are like through the roof. And you would say that, okay, that does show we have an issue with a certain kind of violence, but now we have this resource that has become a thing that other countries don't have. And now that's a cornered resource of really skilled trauma doctors. How can we use that to become the leading trauma training center in the world? Mm. You know, these are the, the type of thoughts that I kind of think about, about issues and problems that other places don't have that we can use as advantages. So it, it's, I find it really exciting because there's always something else, something new to work on. And I think that it really helps me in my career because it's a challenging career. The, the growth is not linear. Your income might be up one year and then down the next. It's really exciting for me to work on something. And then when I feel like, okay, this is annoying me a bit, I can like shift my energy to something else and work on that for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then when that sort of like, oh, it's getting a bit of friction, let me give it a little bit of a break, shift to a different thing. And that has really helped me in this season of like reconnecting with my creativity and reconnecting with it within the music ecosystem because at the end of the day music is such a creative endeavor in the studio but as soon as you step out of that it's the business world now it's about you're trying to sell a product and then there's labels and labels are essentially just corporates they're they work exactly the same doesn't except they don't have to wear business business casual or business formal to the workplace but they are straight up corporates and all of the corporate nonsense and all of the bureaucracy and all of the politics exists within the label system um, if not worse, because it's the Wild West. Mm. And so it's very interesting to realize now as I've grown in the industry of like what I will put up with and what I won't, um, who I will communicate to and what I won't, when do I communicate my value? When do I just let things happen? And how do I speak up about it? You know, that's something that I have realized also with our culture versus the American cultures. Americans are very hectic and like they will tell you I'm great they are not afraid to sell themselves at all audacious they are very audacious in that they'll sell themselves knowing full well that they don't even have any of these things that they're selling to you but they believe in themselves that they will be able to and so you have to you can't come with our like British influence of humility and like you know you have to actually know when you step in a room that I am of value and speak with truth and confidence about that. Um, you know, as I was talking to you offline about a song that we're working on, there's very small nuances in this song that when I'm working with Americans, I can say, hey guys, like, 
the snare actually needs to sound like this or the rhythm needs to be like this if you're implying this subculture. Because if you move the kick to this side, now it's a different subculture and like you're positioning yourself in a tricky space. There are these small nuances that there's no way they would know. And now Afrobeat is a big part of the music world and everyone's trying to tap into it. But the thing is, a lot of the people who are tapping into it are approximating the sound and don't live and breathe it or even know how to dance to it. And so what I'm trying to learn to do is to step into my value and walk into the lane and be like, guys, actually, I see what you're trying to do here. But as a person who lives in this context, this is the nuance that you're missing. And this is how you should go about this. They decide to ignore me. That's a different thing. But I'm not going to be like, oh, it's the head of the biggest label in the world. Why? How can I tell him what to do? No, my boy, I grew up in South Africa. You grew up, I don't know, in Jersey or whatever. There's no ways you could know the difference. I promise you, you ask any executive in America the difference between Gom and Amapiano, they will not be able to tell you. Can they say Gom? No. <laughs> it's <laughs> not there. <laughs> Just start with the click. So it's, it's very interesting. So we've identified a few observations here. The one is South Africans. We've got a secret source. We do things different. We have solutions. We're able to solve problems. The other side, we have the West. I'm gonna say, I mean, in, in your context, it's the US, but I think it does extend beyond. There's problems in the first world that need solutions. You see where I'm getting at. So now, I think the third observation that I'd like us to chat about is the tech side and creativity. And I'm just going to refer to it as create tech because I believe what's happening as technology evolves, we see creativity and technology more and more overlapping between one another. So I think that's kind of the, the bridge between these two observations. How do we take South African and I don't even want to say South African, I want to say African because I think it goes beyond just South Africa. But how do we bridge these two things together using creativity and tech? So how do we bridge the West and Africa together using creativity? Well, yeah. So you said that the, you've seen opportunities abroad. And then we've also said that we've seen that South Africans are perfectly positioned to solve and take advantage of these opportunities. Yeah. How do we use creativity and technology to bridge those two together? So May maybe what we can touch on is you, you've mentioned to me some ideas around content and viewing content as an asset. And that was a very interesting topic to me because I was like, huh, that makes a lot of sense. I will touch on that because that's actually where I was going to go. But I was going to say that I think we have a branding problem as a continent. And people view Africa as this thing that is just substandard in general that needs help, needs to be saved by the West. And yes, the West has way more resources in terms of money, but we have so many resources here that are being like basically stolen from the land and et cetera, et cetera, but we have the people. So what I think in this new data age is what I love about content and art is that it positions us in different places. Just having someone like Trevor Noah raising the flag of South Africa changes the context for people. Uh, someone like Tyler changes the context. Uh, someone like Will, all of these people, Manana, it all starts to shift. It all adds up into rebranding our continent and starting to view it as, oh, a place that investment can come. And not only can that happen, but we can help other people with investment. So I think as we're creating content, whether that's art, videos, creative agencies, like our adverts are incredible in South Africa. I can honestly say that American ads are trash across the board. The only time that they even rival our normal day-to-day -day adverts in South Africa is at the Super Bowl. I think that South African adverts are incredibly well scripted, incredibly well executed. We play on a different playing field, which is interesting to me thinking that America is the advertising capital of the world. So how do we position ourselves as a powerhouse in that space? You know, knowing that we have way more creativity in that certain sector and so what I think we need to do is really use that art to have a, help us gain access and little by little just start cracking the door, just a little by little, more and more and more to the point that other creatives can start to come in because there's always going to be one person that goes there. Like Trevor Noah is a perfect example. He now has the ability to just 
crack a little bit and open the door for other South Africans to come into his space. And slowly but surely, that's when we're going to see this like bringing together of the two worlds and interesting new solutions and um, creatives who are funded in interesting ways and art that comes from the continent that is just on par and surpasses everything else that's out there. And I'm excited for it. So the person listening to this, who's hearing what you're saying, can see the vision, um, wants to be a part of this journey. Like, what do you say to them? Start. And do you, oh, okay, yeah, start. So whatever your vision is, with whatever resources you have, start. It, it genuinely, do not count yourself out for any reason. Find a way to do it. Um, there's an artist that I'm working with right now and the way that he makes the music is on his phone and with the iPod and he literally just clicks a note, makes a little beat on his phone, records his voice and that's it. The only reason that I'm working with him is because I heard those little ideas and now I've been able to work with him because I think he's so talented. But if he didn't do that, I would never have heard of him, never have listened to his music, never have stumbled on his TikTok. We, he wouldn't be here right now. You have to start you have to put something out. If you're a kid from the township and you want to be investment banking, start. I know that sounds insane, but like, how can I start it? Maybe I can start learning about certain things or like making content about interesting things or like the economy of the township. I don't know what it means, but there's a creative way to just get your foot in the door in some sort of way and um, make it happen. So that's my biggest advice. Yeah. And we can even look at like Will. I know that David discovered Will on TikTok. No, not even. It was a family friend. Family friend of a friend linked them. It was like, hey, Will, this is kid. He wants to do songwriting. Can we like pay you to have a session with him? Dave was like, no, don't pay me. Just like, I'll hang out with him. And Will showed up and they wrote a couple of bad songs together. And then the next week, Will sent David another song and it was a little bit better than no one. Within three weeks, he was sending David a song a day that was just getting better and better and better. So it wasn't even about where he started. It was the fact that he had the diligence to go home and be like, I'm going to keep writing. All I have is my phone and this guitar and I'm going to keep writing you song and sending them to you. And they're getting better and better. And he's implementing the advice that David was giving him to the point where he's like, oh, let's hop into studio once a week. They wrote one bad song. They write a second bad song. The third one was kind of good. The fourth one was Miss Me. Like, do you know what I'm saying? It is just start. <laughs> start the thing and be dedicated to your craft because... Like I said, it's not where you start. It's about how you're growing. There's another kid who I'm so inspired by right now, and he wants to be a mixing engineer. And he's just doing the things. He's just going. And he has he's from Fosloras, and I'm like, that's not a resource extensive place. And he's busy doing mixing. That's crazy, the story with Will, because you just came from a concert last night. Yeah. And tell me about that concert. It was insane. Soccer City, I think it was like 50,000 people and just screaming the lyrics to his songs back at him. He played right before Maroon 5 came on and it was just insane. And to see the entire stadium light up with lights and like wave them in the air and sing those lyrics back was, this was magical. And it all started from... It started from just kid who was wanting to do it but the most interesting from, thing for me was that that concept was powerful it was awesome like my manager texted me this morning he's like what's it like having a stadium sing your songs back to you and I was like it was dope but you know what was doper for me was taking some kids from the township and giving them a opportunity to go to a concert and they texted me I was like yo this was actually my first concert I'm like what and I just had some extra tickets and they went and they had the time of their lives and I'm like that for me is impact. Mm -hmm. They all want to be in music. They're all talented kids who are pursuing this. And I had extra tickets. They're like, can we take them? And I was like, yeah, sure. That's the first concert they've ever been to. That for me is impact more than anything. That's like making a difference. Oh, thank you for that. Like I had some FOMO that I missed those tickets, but now I feel a bit better about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it went to a good course. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> so Bubele, one tech gadget that you cannot live without that I cannot live without. Yo, I'm so adverse to all of my tech right now, to be honest. You can only choose one to take with you into an apocalypse. 
only one into an apocalypse. Yeah. What do we consider technology? Does it have to be electronic? No, anything is technology. I mean, a shoe is technology in some other form, right? Okay. I, I would say like a notebook. I, I need to put my thoughts in some visible form. That the apocalypse is happening. For some reason, there's no paper anywhere in the world. I need that notebook just to keep me sane. I'll find something to write on it. I'll make ink, but I need... Like, I wouldn't know how to make paper, but I would find out how to make ink. Like, okay. <laughs> I, I, all right, all right. Um, most unexpected music genre that you enjoy? Unexpected? I am a big, big fan of just like the indie white girl singing sad songs on a guitar. Like Phoebe Bridges. Not Taylor Swift? No, her songs aren't. No, no, here's the thing. Like if Taylor Swift's sad songs are here, like in terms of how sad they are, Phoebe Bridges is like here. Like it is the most heart-wrenching songs you will ever hear. Or C. Rose, amazing. Or Mauro, who's like this Portuguese artist. All of these women are such such great um artist and it's heartbreaking songs on a guitar makes me very happy interesting if you could collaborate with any artist dead or alive who would it be any artist dijon okay dijon is this this artist in the u.s is just insane so brave his music is weird and alternative sort of like frank ocean and bonnie Vere had a baby and it's like, literally, it's like Frank Ocean and Bonnie Vey had a mixed race baby. And it's like, a, it's like a little bit of country, a little bit of folk, a little bit of really weird alt R&B. It's so cool. And I have learned so much from him and I would love to be in a room with that man. Okay. Reminds me of Mustard. <laughs> All right. Um, the best place in Africa for musical inspiration. To be honest, bro, townships. Like, nothing says culture than, like, birthplace where it's living and breathing. It, you, the radio is slow. Streaming, it doesn't give you a good example. If I want to know what's going on, I just, like, go back to the township and you just hang out. That's where you'll see where things are just moving. And I think that music needs to be experienced and not just, like, listened to I think that's what I love about that experience of music. All right. Last one. Dream venue for a live show. Uh, YouTube Theater in LA. It's in SoFi Stadium, but it's like on the side. It's about 6,000 cap. Insane sound. The best sound I've ever heard in my life. And it's like the biggest you could have a venue be and still feel intimate. Even the way that they've structured is like no one's too far away, no one's too far high up. It's just perfectly, it's the perfect venue in my opinion. YouTube theater, so far. Hopefully one day I get the opportunity to experience that. Oh, soon. Let's go. Soon. Bubela boy. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Thank you for joining us. Much, Mr. Josh Dillon. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to join our community, please link with us on WhatsApp. You can scan the QR code and join the WhatsApp group. We would also like to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and please share this with a friend. If you know someone that might stand to gain something from this episode, please do share it with them and join the community. We hope to have you on the podcast at some point as well. So thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Peace.